So um, thank you very much for joining and um, welcome to this. I'm attempting to cover lots of things that can improve your immunity, but too much information can be overwhelming. I'm a firm believer that doing things in bite-sized pieces can work. You don't have to try this all at once, pick one at a time and try to create a habit with it. Once you think you've cracked it, maybe move on to the next one. And I'm going to try and start by explaining the immune system. The immune system, it's the basic defense system for your body. It protects you from harmful pathogens and diseases, and it should prevent, or at least at a minimum, affect, limit the invaders that come into your body. There are three layers of defense. There is the barrier immunity, the innate immunity, and an acquired adaptive immunity. And I'm gonna go through those three for you quickly and then we'll move on to some of the things you can do. The first part of your barrier immunity is your skin. It stops invaders such as viruses penetrating the body. It also produces a kind of biological warfare using proteins to attack the invaders. The skin also has immune cells that will attack the foreign bodies. And when the skin dies and it is shed, it will take any of the foreign bodies away from the body. But it's not just the skin that has barrier immunity. So does your respiratory system. Your lungs have hair-like surfaces called cilia and they flow upwards and carry any foreign bodies out of your lungs, back out through your nose and your mouth. Your, gastro sorry, your gastrointestinal system is also part of your barrier immunity as is your genitourinary and also your nose. So if you think about it, basically any orifice from your body um, has um, a barrier immunity to it. But also your stomach does too. Your stomach has a high acid content. If your acid production is not compromised, the pH level will be low and the acid will kill all the invaders. But if your acid production is compromised, it won't kill all the invaders and they'll get through your barrier immunity. Tears are also part of your barrier immunity. So the next layer is your innate layer. What does this mean? It translates to in, inside, and nate means born. So it is something that you are born with. It was already present in your body from the time you were born. It comes from your parents. And there are many different cell types with different actions. For example, neutrophils, and they use a process called phagocytosis. Phago means to eat and cytosis means cell. So you have cells in your body that go around eating um, all the foreign bodies. And usually they are the first cells to arrive when a pathogen or disease is discovered by your body. They contain chemicals and enzymes and the neutrophil will surround the pathogen and then use chemicals within them to destroy the invader. The neutrophil is one example of cells. We have eight different types of cells that attack and destroy foreign particles, each of them having slightly different roles. And they also work alongside the complementary systems which secrete enzymes which act to stop the invaders. This part of your immune system is very fast responding. And then you have the adaptive immunity. This develops after we were born. It is created in response to exposure to a foreign body or infection. Your body learns how to fight a specific infection. So it remembers the pathogen and the previously successful response and triggers the same response using lymphocytes and antibodies. Antibodies do not always kill the pathogen, but they can call other defences to aid in this destruction, such as phagocytes or enzymes. But this adaptive system is a slow responder. So what can we do to help our immune system work effectively? So we move on to the little bit of more interesting stuff. So coming on to nutrients, what you eat impacts your immune system. The best way to improve your immune system is to eat a healthy diet. 
This in itself is a minefield. What is healthy for one person is not healthy for another. And just a very small example of this would be nuts. It can kill some people and others are fine. It is important to understand that vitamins and minerals are required to improve your immunity. These can be obtained from the diet. But modern farming methods may not provide as much as you need, so sometimes supplementation could be a benefit. I'm going to go through a list of vitamins and minerals that are really key for your immune system. Um, and if you obviously if you've got um, a notepad and paper, it's a good idea to write some of these down. I'm going to give you what they do, what they are, and also some examples of them. Vitamin A helps to produce white blood cells in the bone marrow. I mentioned neutrophils earlier, they are white blood cells. So vitamin A is found in fish, meat, liver, carrots, spinach, broccoli, cheese, apricots, mangoes, and they're just a few examples. Um, if you were to use Google and type in um, food with vitamin A in it, you'd get lots of different articles giving you lots of information. Vitamin B, this strengthens your immune system. There are seven different B vitamins. If vitamin B9 and B12 are low, then the immune system will be impacted. You won't fight infections as well. But vitamin B, all the different variants are in things like meat, fish, milk, yogurt. My favourite are asparagus, avocados, banana and strawberries. They're all very high in vitamin B. Vitamin B is a complex, so they all have different roles. Um, folate, for example, is part of the vitamin B complex. And if you have digestive issues, you may not be synthesizing or using these particular vitamins. I will come on to that further to give you some more information. So vitamin C is the next one. I'm sure everybody's aware this is good for you when you've got colds. Everybody goes straight to it. It's commonly used to boost your immunity and reduce the time that you have a cold or flu. It can also help to remove toxins from the body. It's actually known as a chelator. Uh, chelator is um, a vitamin that will, or, or a mineral that will actually strip toxins out of your body. It's found in oranges, lemons, bell peppers, blackberries, kale, strawberries, kiwis, just to name a few. And next comes vitamin E. It helps our cells to regenerate. It's found in walnuts, almonds, peanuts. If you've got a nut allergy, it's also found in spinach, broccoli and sunflower seeds. Vitamin K. And this one is useful for our digestive system where a high percentage of our immunity is found. And for some unknown reason, I haven't put a list together for what vitamin K has. I can always do that later. Let's make a little note of that. Iron, that's the next biggie, helps carry oxygen to your cells via your circulatory system. Um, it's found in red meat, chicken, beans, broccoli and kale. And I'm going to name a few that are a little bit less common. There's one called selenium. This is a mineral and it reduces the oxidative stress on your cells. It helps your body fight disease. It reduces inflammation, which is very important to your immune system. And it can be found in eggs, shiitake mushrooms, tuna, Brazil nuts. Two more to go, three more to go actually. Um, zinc, this helps with wound healing. It helps your cells divide. So we're constantly replacing our body. Um, it's found in meat, fish, beans and nuts. And zinc is one of the few um, minerals that actually you can get toxicity for. So it is recommended that you don't take more than 45 milligrams a day. And then omega-3. I'm going to cover omega-3 again a little bit later on. It helps you absorb sunlight. It's found in fish, specifically tuna, herring, anchovies, mackerel, salmon, all those oily fishes. But even cod, which is not an oily fish, does have some omega-3 in it. So we're going to move on to the next um, vitamin, which is vitamin D. 
And as you can see, I've brought the sunshine into our slides. Sunshine on a snowy day. So where to get your vitamin D? Vitamin D is a unique mineral, uh, vitamin because it can be made in the body from exposure to sunlight. How much vitamin D you get from sunshine is different in every person. It depends on a few things. Your skin colour, where the sun is in the sky and where you live in the world. So here in the UK, the sunlight is not so strong during the winter and it doesn't give us enough to meet our recommended daily allowance. And just for your information, the RDA is 10 micrograms, or if you know it in another way, they, they measure it in UI, I think that's a universal index, and that's 400 UI. So in the winter, in the UK, we pretty much don't get enough of the vitamin D that we need. So I think it is actually recommended, if you go onto the NHS website, they do actually recommend that we take a vitamin D supplement. And especially if you go out today, I went out today and I think my eyes and my nose were showing. I don't think any other part of my body was showing, so I definitely wouldn't have got any vitamin D today. <clears throat> There is also a feeling that the RDA that is given um, on many websites is not enough for many nutrients. So although the RDA is 10 micrograms, it may be that you need to have a little bit more than that. And be aware that RDAs are dependent on age. So a child may not need as much of an RDA or an old person over, over 65 might need more. Um, I would, um, after doing some investigation on this, I would actually recommend uh, that you have an intake of 25 to 100 micrograms, and that should be enough to ensure um, you've got enough in your blood. So I would like to provide you with a list of the benefits of getting vitamin D. So while you're reading this little list, I'm going to read a few more bits and pieces. There are other sources of vitamin D, fish, especially oily fish, like we mentioned earlier. Um, some other fish like cod and trout also contain it. And also how you cook your fish can deplete the levels of vitamin D. So steaming and baking hold on to more of the initial levels of vitamin D do than, for example, pan frying. Eggs also contain vitamin D and so do mushrooms. But how about this for an interesting fact? Mushrooms only contain vitamin D if they were grown outside. If, and how are you gonna find that out? I don't think they put on the labeling that it was grown outdoors. Um, a lot of times mushrooms can be grown inside. So it's something to be mindful of. You can also get, um, you can also get your vitamin D from supplements. Omega-3 tablets actually have vitamin D in it, and so do cod liver oil tablets, or alternatively you could take a vitamin D tablet. But did you know there are two different types of vitamin D? There are vitamin D2 and vitamin D3. Vitamin D2 is obtained from the UV radiation of the yeast sterile estrogel. And estrogel is similar to cholesterol and it's found naturally in some exposed mushrooms. Um, UVB light from the sun strikes the skin and humans synthesize vitamin D3. So it is the most natural form. Vitamin D is also found in the oily rich foods. Um, it is then ingested and absorbed into your lymphatic system and enters your blood. So as I've said, vitamin D comes from the skin or your diet, but it is biolog biologically inert and it requires your body's involvement to activate it. So first it comes into the liver and then it comes down to the kidneys. And once it's been through both of those processes, it is then a biologically active form of vitamin D. And vitamin D is needed to stimulate 
intestinal calcium absorption. Calcium is really important from the body. Not only is it in your bones, but without calcium, your muscles don't fire. You need it for every single movement your body does. So without vitamin D, you only get between 10 and 15% of the dietary calcium that your body needs and about 60% of phosphorus. Vitamin D enhances calcium and phosphorus absorption by between 30 and 40% and 80% respectively. So do you think you're low in vitamin D? Well, I didn't think I was, but in March last year, I asked for a vitamin D blood test and was told that my levels were at 17 NG milliliters. Um, and I'm gonna show you that in the next slide, I think. Yes, so on this slide, my levels were 17 NG. So if you look at the, um, the bits at the top of the page, um, it says the COVID-19 um, COVID severity, I was in the first bracket. So that means um, if I had had vitamin D levels as they were a year ago, if I was to have caught COVID, I would have suffered quite critically. This slide is an American slide. This is not a UK slide, but this is gathered with evidence. Um, I haven't had my vitamin D tested again, but I do now take a vitamin D supplement and I have since March of last year. Um, I hope that after 10 months of suppl supplementations, my levels will be much better, especially with all that garden yoga we did last year. <laughs> so this shows that if your vitamin D levels are low, uh, you, it could be an impact to you. I would hope with the amount of vitamin D I'm taking, um, that I'm now in the, um, the fourth column rather than that. So just wanted to show you that it can have an impact. Again, the next slide I'm showing you is also from the US and it shows you um, by ethnicity, how many people within that environment. So for example, if you look at the column that's um, the white column, they tested 2,377 people. There's a number in a bracket at the bottom. And basically this is saying that if you're in green, you are in the minority. So I think on that particular screen, it's not even 20% of people that are white that were tested had enough vitamin D in their body. So um, for example, they've been saying quite a lot of Asian and black people have been struggling with the COVID um, symptoms. And if you can see, it also shows that they've got vitamin D deficiencies. So moving on to my next slide. So um, getting vitamin D through sunshine is a controversial topic. So I wanted to give you some more information so that you can make an informed decision. Sunshine is good for our health. There are three types of UV light that come from the sun, UVA, UVB and UVC. And vitamin D isn't the only benefit we get from sunshine. We also get nitric oxide and I will come on to nitric oxide in a bit. We're gonna start with UVA. It's less implicated in skin cancer but it does contribute to aging and wrinkles. So um, for UVA, it is de dependent on the time of day, not the temperature to be effective. So this slide shows you that um, in the morning when it's in the blue area, that's when it's better to get UVA light. So obviously in the winter, it doesn't matter, but as you come into the height of the summer, it's suggesting that you get the sun after about four o'clock and before about nine o'clock. And the, the more it comes into midday, the more chance you have of, of burning yourself. So um, the recommendation is stay out of the sun between 11 and two, unless it's, unless it's a normal British day and it's not that hot, but we did have some very hot days um, last year. 
So it is in the summer, it is better to get in morning or late evening sun and in the winter, any time of day. This is the index for the summer. UVA releases nitric oxide into the skin. So what benefits does nitric oxide have? If you um, know me, I do put the odd video on YouTube and a little while ago I did a video about humming bee breath. Um, so humming bee breath is a really important way of activating the nitric oxide. But this shows you that nitric oxide um, opens your blood vessels, improves your blood cell strength. I mean, you can read it as I'm chatting along improves your immunology, it, in, it regulates your inflammation, it improves your immunity. So you get nitric oxide released in your skin by getting UVA. So it's not just that, this, that vitamin D comes from the sun, but nitric oxide does too. So we're going to move on. Hopefully everybody's read that. So coming back to this slide, UVB is the main cause of sunburn and skin cancer, but UVB promotes vitamin D. UVC does not penetrate the atmosphere, but studies have found that suppl supplementing fish oil or obtaining fish oil via foods can reduce your exposure to sunburn from vitamin UVB. There's actually been some really good studies on this and they show the more fish oil you have in your skin, um, the less you burn. So therefore allowing you to stay in the sun a little bit more. So I wanted to show you the benefits of omega-3 fish oil. Fish oil can re reduce the effects of UVA on the immune system by around about 48%. But don't confuse omega-3 with omega-6. They are different. Omega-6 is found in vegetable oils. So, um, sorry. Um, omega-6 is found in vegetable oils and margarine, which are rich in omega-6. They do cause inflammation in your skin and that can increase your risk of skin cancer and also increase the risk of a lowered immunity. So on this slide, it suggests that you should increase the amount of omega-3 in your diet and reduce your omega-6. So not only will that improve your immune system, but it will also reduce your body's ability to burn Alcohol. Oh, no. Sorry, you know what's coming. <laughs> Alcohol intake can kill normally healthy gut bacteria. And these bacteria help to promote not only your health, but they also reduce the risk of infection and reduce the risk of inflammation. Alcohol can also help leak bacteria out of your gut. And in turn, this causes all sorts of inflammation in your um, whole body. So, for example, in your lungs, alcohol damages the immune cells and the fine hairs that we talked about earlier, the cilia. And they have an important job of clearing pathogens out of our airway. So if the cell linings of your airway are damaged from alcohol, then viral particles can more easily gain access they will stop your body from fighting off infection and it won't work as well. So it will lead to increased overall risks of more severe diseases as well as complications. And did you know that once you take a sip of alcohol, your body prioritises breaking down alcohol over several other bodily functions? The body doesn't have a way to store alcohol like it does carbohydrates and fats. So it has to immediately send it to the liver where it's metabolised. So it puts the liver under strain, under pressure. Alcohol is known to impair your sleep quality. And the less sleep a person gets, the higher the risk for getting sick. It impacts your deep sleep and it's harder to get back to sleep if you wake after taking alcohol. 
and alcohol also diminishes the amount of zinc in your body, the vital nutrient I mentioned earlier that's needed by the body. And if that's not already a shock to your system, then the next one will be. Ooh, cold showers, Ooh, makes you shiver just thinking about it. They can actually improve your energy, your alertness and blood circulation. As the body in response to the shock of cold water deepens its breathing and increases its heart rate to warm up and increase your oxygen intake. Cold showers can also improve your mood by stimulating noradrenaline secretion in the brain to the extent that cold showers are often prescribed by doctors as a treatment for those suffering from depression. Taking a cold shower has been known to increase your immune system by 30%. Um, it boosts testosterone levels, and although that's a male hormone, we all have it in our bodies. It is needed by women as well as men, and it has several metabolic and fat burn burning advantages to boot. So I'm just going to show you a list of all the other benefits that having a cold shower has. I'm sure you can read those on screen instead of listening to me. Um, Detoxing and helping eliminate toxins in strengthening the improves, uh, strengthening the immune system, obviously good ones. Um, <clears throat> and as I said at the beginning of this, I have done all of these and I do this one regularly. So every time I have a shower, I do this. When you get out of a normal shower, do you find the room is always cold? If you take a cold shower, your body will be used to the cold and you won't feel the cold in the bathroom anymore. So I just thought I'd give you a few tips on what to do when taking a cold shower. Start with your normal shower and do everything you normally do. Um, wash your hair, have a shower. Um, take some deep breaths to get um, the air in through your nose, get yourself prepared, and then lower the temperature. You don't have to lower it straight to cold. You can turn it down gradually, it depends on your tap and how you turn the shower. And I have to press a button to get it to go down. So I just do it slowly and get myself there. Stay under as long as you can or you want to. The first thing that will happen when it gets to the right temperature is you will take a sharp, deep intake of breath. It'll be like, <gasps> like you put your, your um, shoulders under the water when you go for an open water swim. Uh, remember those beach holidays. Stay under as long as you can. Um, use your breathing deep and slow to help you stay under longer. And you can start with five seconds and progress up to 60. I think I managed 40 seconds this morning um, and then I had to get out, it was too cold. There was no right and wrong, just what works for you. If you feel you're going to hyperventilate, be aware of your breath and try to slow it down. If you can't, it's not a problem. Just get out of the shower, but don't give up keep trying, it will get better. And you can even celebrate with an arm pump to stoke your body. It's a mini reward, you did it. Um, first time I went for it, I really wasn't sure about it. Um, I'd watched a video. Um, if anybody's heard of Wim Hof, he talks about rewiring your immune system by having cold showers and certain breathing techniques. And uh, it was him that I saw doing this. And I've seen lots of other videos on it. And actually, it's now part of my routine. So I make sure at the end of every shower, water goes cold. But what next? Maybe outdoor swimming. I've actually been thinking about that today, thinking I might do that next year. So I'm going to um, change the mood a little bit and make you feel a little bit more comfortable. And get my screen to work. Massage. And we'll write this one. How does massage help the immune system? It improves your body's lymphocyte production. That's one of your white blood cells and they help to destroy the baddies. It enhances immunity by stimulating lymph flow, the body's natural defense system. And your lymph system works alongside your circulatory system. It also helps to flush toxins out of your body. So again, they're not just for helping ease tight muscles or problems that you've got. Massage is good for just your general well-being. Don't forget to relax. Take some time out for yourself. Chill out, feel calm. Imagine you've got the sun shining on you. What a beautiful place for a hammock. 
so exercise. This is a picture of my husband um, and this is Warrior 3. He was showing off his yoga skills when we were out. I think this is in um, Holbridge somewhere, down, um, down where the um, alpacas are. So when he saw this, he just said, oh my God, I look fat. So research shows that physical activity can boost self-esteem, mood, sleep, quality and energy, as well as reducing your risk of stress, depression, dementia and Alzheimer's. If exercise were a pill, it would be one of the most cost-effective drugs ever invented, said a guy called Nick Cahill, who's a health promotion consultant. I just liked that quote. For any type of activity to benefit your health, you need to be moving quick enough to raise your heart rate, it's breathing faster and feeling warmer. If you're working at a moderate intensity, you should still be able to talk, but you wouldn't be able to sing the words of a song. An activity where you have to work even harder is called vigorous intensity activity. And there is substantial evidence that um, vigorous activity can bring health benefits over and above that of moderate activity. You can tell when it's vigorous activity because you're breathing hard and fast and your heart rate has gone up quite a bit. And you're working at this level, you won't be able to say more than a few words without pausing for breath. And I was interested to see where yoga came in, in all this, bearing in mind you all know me from yoga. So does yoga fit into any of the above categories, moderate intensity or vigorous intensity? Because I don't believe it holds you at moderate or vigorous level mentioned on the NHS website. I wondered if it had ever been proved, so then I went off and did some investigation. And it has. And these are the points I found. In yoga, muscles respond to stretching by becoming larger and capable. <clears throat> Sorry, I've lost my place. Capable of extracting and using more oxygen more quickly. In other words, the side best benefits of flexibility include increased muscle strength and endurance. Yoga may also improve strength, aerobic capacity and lung function, depending on the practice. And if you come to any of my classes, you know I'm always working on your lungs. I actually think we all had our heart rate up this morning, up to this morning's class as well. It improves your health, reduces your stress, improves your sleep. This is yoga, not just exercise. And it often acts like a powerful therapy to help heal relationships, improve your career and boost your overall outlook on life. You just need to make sure your yoga practice includes a balance of poses that build strength, stamina and flexibility, along with breath work and meditation to help develop body awareness. Finally, yoga tunes into your body and helps you to better coordinate your actions when you bring your breath, your awareness and your physical body into harmony, you allow your body to work at its maximum capacity, fitness capacity. A yoga class is merely a laboratory for how to be in harmony with the body in every activity outside of yoga. This improved physical wellness and fluidity enhance not just the well-being, the physical well-being, but they also permeate all levels of our being. And unlike exercise, yoga offers a path to constant improvement. So we're going to move on to our digestion. How healthy is your digestion? This picture shows your full digestive tract. So basically your digestion starts in your mouth, chewing your food. And that's how you start to break down your food. Your body adds enzymes and the more you chew your food, again, really trying to chew your food down is really good for your immunity. I often ask people to think about that if I'm talking nutrition with them. It's one of the first things I'll say. And slowing your chewing down can have a really good impact on your stomach because it has less work to do because you've already started to break the food down in your mouth. So next stop is your stomach. If anything is wrong here, it can put the whole of your digestive system out of whack. So if you've got acid reflux, 
you suffer from gagging, heartburn, burping, feeling gassy or feeling sick, they're all signs that there's something wrong in the stomach and some work may need to be done on that. Once released from the stomach, it then moves on to the intestines and the pancreas, the gallbladder and the liver are immediately involved. They help to break down fats, control your blood sugar levels and produce enzymes, etc., to break the food down further. Your intestines are covered in cells called enterocytes, and these stop unwanted nasties from getting through your intestinal lining. And if they are in good condition, then nothing will get through your intestinal lining that shouldn't do. But if they are in a bad condition, then your digestive system really needs some help. So let me just show you a comical version of a good and bad enterocyte. So what you want is the healthy one on the left rather than the sick one on the other side. They, they release digestive enzymes and the stronger they're, they're cilia. You've got these little hair things all the way around the body. They're microscopic and they help move the food along. They help digest the food. And if it looks like the sick one, um, then you have got to do some work on your stomach. Different processes happening in your small and large Sorry, different processes happen in your small and large intestines and so do different illnesses, IBS, bloating, Crohn's disease, colitis, excessive farting, diarrhoea, constipation, diverticulitis. These are all problems from your small and large intestine, but it's just the smallest I've given. There are many other things. Your gut health can impact the health of the rest of your body from your skin your blood health, your moods, your sleep, your heart health. What you feed yourself and how your body uses it impacts everyday life. If the body isn't functioning well, then you might start struggling to get the right nutrients from your food. So where do we start? I'm going to bring in probiotics and tell you a little bit about probiotics. What are probiotics? They are beneficial microbes. They are microbes that work in synergy with your body, not against it. The word probiotic translates to pro-life or for life, whereas antibiotics means against life. You have more microbes in your body than you have your own cells. I remember hearing that the percentage is around about 95% microbes to 5% body. Your mother passes her microbes to you whilst in the womb and during natural childbirth and continues to help build your microbes by breastfeeding. Colostrum has up to 40% probiotic content. So how do you continue to build your beneficial microbes once breastfeeding stops? You have to feed them with life cultures, such as a probiotic supplement or a natural yogurt with life, live cultures. There are also some foods that you can take that can help feed your microbes. Um, some things like kimchi, sauerkraut, kefir, Kombucha seems to be the one that's the one that everybody's talking about at the moment. Kombucha is a tea um, and also lassi, which is a Indian drink. It's a milk fermented milk drink. These all have very rich cultural heritages. So sauerkraut, I'm sure you all know, is a German fermented cabbage. Um, but the Germans have been eating it for years. It's not gone out of the diet. Pickles are also... Um, a fermented food but there a lot of the pickles we eat from the supermarkets these days have got sugar in them um, and it's not necessarily the right way to do a pickle but they do have rich cultural heritage and medicinal benefits so why are they important probiotics are responsible for 70 percent of our immune response probiotics stimulate everything from your t cells to your macrophages and these are your white blood cells. Probiotics can activate phagocytic cells to coordinate an immune response. 
I mentioned them earlier when we were talking about the immune system. Basically, they're the killer cells that go in and kill all of the viruses or um, baggies that come into your body. So, probiotics are the new antibiotic. Antibiotics nuke our body's immune system. It is well known that antibiotics kill bacteria and can make us better, but it isn't well known. But what isn't well known is that antibiotics also kill your good bacteria. They strip you of all of the bacteria you have in your body. And since probiotics compromise 70 to 80% of our immune response, antibiotics will impact your immunity. The moment our probiotics are gone, opportunistic parasites, fungi and pathogenic bacteria rush to fill the ecological void. Moreover, this use of antibiotics will create drug resistant bacteria that can't be defeated by antibiotics. The use of antibiotics can create superbugs like MRSA, which are immune to many different antibiotics. And in some cases, they are immune to all antibiotics known to man. However, it's not all doom and gloom. Probiotics can defeat these bugs with ease. Probiotic bacteria and pathogenic bacteria have been fighting for billions of years and healthy humans have the perfect environment for probiotic bacteria to beat the pathogenic bacteria. The fact that humans have been surviving before the invention of antibiotics is proof how powerful probiotics are. As an example, did you know that humans can't actually digest lactose, which is found in milk? It's our probiotics that digest it. So if you have an overgrowth of bad bacteria, they can actually create morphine from these substances and you then become addicted to your own body's ability to create morphine. But you get sick because your body is unable to digest the lactose and casein. But because you're addicted to the morphine, you just keep taking it. So it may be worth taking a step back and listening to what your body has to say. Did you know, for example, colic is due to baby not being able to digest lactose? If you, if you as the mother, stop drinking while breastfeeding, your baby's colic will go away. It will take a few days to remove all milk from their body. This shows that the mother didn't pass potentially the, best, the, the correct probiotics onto their child for breaking down lactose. It's not their fault, it's only a recent discovery. So, probiotics also help to synthesize vitamins and minerals in your digestive tract. And you need your healthy microbiome to help you utilize the list. So quite a few of these I mentioned earlier, vitamin A, K, vitamin B, um, iron, zinc. I mentioned all of those earlier. And if your probiotics are in a bad place, they can't then utilize or create these vitamins within your body so then your body starts to suffer with other issues so it is mindful to be aware of that probiotics help rebuild your gut biome but they need the right foods to help the good ones flourish and for the bad ones to die off and this is where prebiotics come in prebiotics are food for your beneficial biome they are high fibre foods such as garlic, onions, leeks, asparagus, dates, beetroot, fennel. It's actually quite a big list, but it's, as you can imagine, all healthy vegetables rather than having any processed food. Like ourselves, probiotics have a lifespan, so it is important to keep topping them up. And my recommendation would be to take probiotic supplement or to take one of the probiotics I mentioned earlier like sauerkraut, kimchi, kefir or kombucha. So I'm going to move away from probiotics. I'm going to talk about your emotions now. Your emotions can have an important um, impact on you. What can you what can you do to increase your positive emotions? 
so happiness and laughter are you getting enough i know it's tough at the moment but laughter is really important send jokes and good news stories to friends watch your favorite comedian it makes you feel happy and releases serotonin which is the happy hormone it also releases oxytocin and dopamine it's all good for making you feel good this is internal medicine happiness helps your healthiness make sure you laugh every day i actually go looking for clips on youtube just to try and make myself laugh love and joy give love let someone know that you are thinking of them even just a text it will make you and them feel better smile or talk to someone you don't know as you walk past them as we're all doing lots of walking at the moment i've struck up loads of conversations as i'm out walking got called a child earlier today as i was i was surfing down the ice <laughs> So joy, what brings, what, do what brings you joy, a hobby, talking to a family member, watching the sunset or sunrise, jumping in puddles with your wellies, open your eyes to nature. Today is a brand new day, be inspired by the possibilities. Relax, remember that slide I had in there, that man sitting on the uh, hammock. I know that's hard to do. But there are things that you know that will make you relax. It's a hard list to prepare, but I'm going to give you a few things that might help you out. Meditating, coming to my yoga classes, <laughs> listen to music, read, sit still and admire the nature, lay down and chill. What about a hobby? I know there's a, a knitter, maybe cross stitch, photography, painting. Um, I'm a bird watcher, I love my birds. Um, maybe you've got a pet and you take the dog for a walk. These are all things that make you relax. It doesn't have to be something that raises your heart rate. It's okay to go slow. You don't have to be busy, busy all day long. When we relax, the flow of blood increases around our body, giving us more energy. It helps us to have a calmer and clearer mind, which aids positive, positive thinking, concentration, memory and decision making. Relaxation slows our heart rate, reduces our blood pressure and relieves tension. It also aids digestion as we absorb essential nutrients more efficiently when we relax. It also helps to fight off disease and infection and therefore aids our immune system. But there's another side to emotions. We've just talked about increasing the positive ones. And you need to think about releasing suppressed emotions. We hold on to emotions from our past and they can stop us being present in the moment. They cause stress and fear, which are bad for our health. What can we do to release these? Where to start with fear? When a thought comes into your mind that shows you are fearful, you need to be aware of it. It might be worth writing it down. What was it? Do you understand why you have had that thought and where it comes from? Fear is a common emotion, but it can stop us in our tracks, even for the simplest thing. But remember that it's you that created the fear around a situation. What's to say that you can't reverse it? You can take yourself back to the situation and see if you can deal with it differently. Think about practicing daily forgiveness. We all have things in our past that we need to forgive or get forgiveness for, but be mindful that these are your thoughts put into your mind by you. The person that may have caused the problem has no idea you are thinking of them in this way. This is about you forgiving, not getting them to forgive you. Think about the situation and see how you can release it from your mind. And I, as I said at the beginning, I have done all of this. I can assure you it's very satisfying and it helps you to understand where your fear came from. Um, I have a fear of abandonment or had a fear of abandonment. I think it's much better now. I used to have a really horrible dream 
um, about it. And that dream's gone since I overcame and forgave the particular situation. Don't forget, you may have to forgive yourself for what you may have done. Again, if this doesn't work for you and you find it harder to deal with, um, then it might be time to do some fear or forgiveness meditation. I do have scripts for both of these, so we could always do a meditation session if you needed it, or we could just add it to a class that you attend if you let me know. Again, there are alternatives like seeing a healer, a counsellor, a Reiki master or a hypnotist. Again, I know all of them, so if you ever need anybody, um, please let me know and I can pass you on. Emotions are a fundamental aspect of our lives. They are an important part of what makes us human. The goal is not to make us happy 100% of the time, but to let all of our emotions flow, positive and negative. Don't allow the emotion to get stuck or blocked. Cry when you need to, ask for a hug if you're scared and laugh until your sides hurt. So that covers our emotions. I'd like to move on to journaling now. This is just a picture of a journal and I love the quote at the bottom that says, what you get by achieving your goals is not as important as what you become by achieving your goals. I think that's quite important. There are different ways to keep a journal. Uh, one idea is to write down your positive and negative thoughts throughout the day. You need to think about what made you have that emotion. If you felt sad, why? Whilst I was compiling this part on Tuesday last week, unfortunately, Captain Sir Tom Moore passed away and I genuinely cried. I've never met the guy, but I had emotion and I sobbed. But I went on to read more about him and I found a piece from the school around the corner to him and the kids said, they had been lucky enough to be living next door to their own superhero. And that immediately made me have a big smile on my face. I felt proud and I was able to release the sad emotion and bring the happy emotion in. So like a child does when they fall over, cry and then get back up and run. That was the feeling um, I had on that particular day. And I wrote that in my journal. Again, I keep a journal. Um, I've been keeping a journal for about a year. You could use your journal to focus on your goals or your values, like the page in front of you. How did you do? You don't have to have as many goals as this. This is like 10 goals because um, it will put pressure on you. Start small and slowly bring it in. I keep a journal and I have it on my PC, so it's not a book. I actually type it in every day um, or almost every day. I do miss the odd one. And then I go back to it and reference things. I also highlight things that I would like to do in red, but I don't hold myself to it. But sometimes I go back looking for something and I find something highlighted in red and it reminds me to do things. The last time I did this, I wrote about losing my childhood to caring for my dad. So then it reminded me to go back and see if I could investigate anything more about it. And I discovered when I discovered the note, I went online and found an interesting article on that particular situation, it told me that I wasn't alone and that I need to take responsibility for my own self-worth. I found it quite powerful and I go back and read the article as I have linked it to my journal. So I've been back and read that yesterday when I was writing this piece for this particular workshop. Um, so um, having a journal, this is just another example. You could, um, Make a note of how you're feeling. Take a couple of minutes to get it out onto paper or a file on your PC. Again, it could be something that's making you feel anxious. Then maybe think about the one thing that you can do that prepares you for that particular scenario arising. And then you could also put another reason down that you think it won't be as bad as you are feeling now as you're putting it into the journal. So by journaling, it does help you to get a hold of your emotions, your feelings. And when I first started, when I went back over my journal, I found out I, I, I tended to wake up with quite a negative head in the morning and it would take me a couple of hours to bring myself around. 
But now, because of my journey and all the things I've done for myself, I do wake up feeling quite energised and I have quite a positive head of me. Not every day. Uh, being a female, I'm sure some of you will be aware there are certain days of the month that um, you want to kill everybody. <laughs> um, and I do occasionally have that. So, um, journaling, really good, really important way to do it. And if you need any help or advice, please feel free to ask. I'm going to move on to sleep now. So if you've been attending any of my classes recently, you may have heard my meditation about the pineal gland. I wanted to show you where the pineal gland was. So there's two little pictures there to show you where the pineal gland is. Light stimulates your pineal gland, the hormone gland in your head. It comes into your eyes and the pineal gland has photoreceptors and differentiates between light and dark. The pineal gland releases serotonin during the day and light, which is your happy home hormone, and it releases melatonin during the evening or darkness. So if the day isn't as bright or you don't go out, you won't release as much serotonin and may not feel so happy. But I want to share something else with you that I found out recently. Did you know that light is actually measured in lux? The luminescence of light is measured. So let me set the scene for how much lux you get. So this is a, this was from Wikipedia. This shows you how much lux or illuminance you get from different places. So when there's no moon in the sky and it's an overcast night, you get bugger all lux, 0.001. Um, if you're in an office oh, that's got not many windows, you get 80 lux. <clears throat> and if you go right down to the bottom and you get full direct sunlight, possibly on a summer's day, that last slide, but then just different scenarios to show you. So one thing to think about what you can do to improve your lux or decrease your lux. Bear in mind we've been talking about the pineal gland. In the evening we now have the benefit two words together, the benefit of electricity and we have adjusted our lives to use artificial light. Bright TV and lights on in the evening, this impacts your production of melatonin and means we are more awake in the evening. Your body still needs between seven and nine hours sleep every night. And you might find that you're ending up being more tired in the morning because the light is so artificial in the evening. But there is something in what they say about stopping screens, so TVs, laptops, phones, at least 30 minutes before you go to bed. Otherwise, you won't have enough melatonin to help send you to sleep. But there are some things you can do. And again, as I said earlier, I am trying these myself. So... I'm actually turning the lights down in the evening room as soon as I get there. I put my screen down. I try not to look at my phone. I used to sit with my laptop on my, my, my um, lap whilst I was watching the telly. So I'd have the screen light, my phone would be there and the telly. So now the lights have been put down at least an hour before we go to bed. And I have no screens in bed unless I'm going to listen to a sleep meditation, but I turn my phone over and put the light down so that the bedroom is dark. And if you set this as a goal um, or a habit, you might actually find that your sleep gradually improves. I have been doing this for about five days now and I am finding that I am going to sleep a little bit quicker in the evening. I used to roll around quite a while. I probably would be awake for at least half an hour, but I reckon I'm down to about 15 minutes maximum now. And what one day I don't even remember putting my head on the pillow, it was straight out. And I hadn't had alcohol, I'd like to point that out as well. <laughs> so thank you very much. I hope that I've given you lots to think about, but don't allow yourself to get overwhelmed. Take it slowly. Pick one at a time and add it to your routine if that's what you want to do. I try to add something new regularly. 
So this week it's been turning the lights down in the evening and putting my phone down before bed. I can say that, as I said, I've been doing it for about five days, but I feel I'm going to sleep faster, but it's only a feeling. I don't have stats. I'm not plugging myself into any computers or anything to get any readings. So, but it's something that I've looked into and I'm trying. There are many more things that you can try, but I only had an hour and I have overrun. I um, would love to hear from you which ones you try. And as I said, I'm happy to field any questions you have. But don't forget, if you don't feel comfortable, you can always ask me privately. I just need to do my disclaimer. Everyone is different. We all have different likes and dislikes, different strengths and weaknesses, and illness can appear in different ways. The information in this workshop is my opinion and is intended for information only. I am not medically trained. I am a nutritionist, but I am not medically trained. The important, the information provided here is, to de is designed to support, not to place any relationship you already have with your existing practitioner or physician. This has been gathered on my journey to wellness and it is shared for informational purposes only. And as I said, all information here is gathered from research and studies. I have not made any of this up. I've been trying them and I've read lots of evidence on it. I just wanted to say um, thank you for watching my video or attending the workshop that this video is actually recorded doing. Um, if you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to my channel. Details are down below. Um, if you enjoyed it, please like it. Please add any comments that um, gets me known out in the world of YouTube. So brilliant. Thank you very much. Namaste.